You are listening to Scribble Talk, a podcast for bid and proposal professionals. My name is Bhaskar Sundram and with my co-host, Ashley Kays, we will be sitting down with our industry veterans to share their stories, discuss their career and learn how to make an impact in the industry. Today's guest is Dick Eason. Dick Eason, aka Wordman, is a certified fellow of the Association of Proposal Management Professionals, past APMP Chief Executive Officer, recipient of the APMP William C. McRae Founders Award, past chair of the APMP California chapter, and a proud member of the chapter's mentor program. Dick has presented at more than 15 APMP international conferences on using Microsoft Word for proposal development. Dick has authored over 40 articles for Wordman's Production Corner in the APMP Perspective. In his 40 plus years of experience, Dick has led or contributed to numerous proposals in the US, UK, Canada, Germany, and Australia. Dick has a BSc in Electrical and Electronic Engineering from the University of Leeds in England. Welcome, Dick, to Scribble Talk. Great to have you with us. Thanks, Ashley and Amanda. Thanks for having me. Dick, we're going to start back in the beginning and kind of discuss where you're from, where you were born, and where you got your education. Yeah, so as you can tell from my voice, even though I live in California, I was actually uh, from the UK originally, born in the county of Kent, just southeast of London. Uh, I grew up actually in the city of Peterborough in the east of England, went to uh, grammar school there, and then um, went to the University of Leeds in the north of England, got my degree in electrical electronic engineering. And then ended up uh, postgraduate working for um, the Marconi company. Um, it's no longer around, but it used to be a very big company. Uh, and I was uh, doing radio communications. So that's where I started my career. Oh, that's very exciting. So I understand you had over 20 years of experience there at the Marconi Communications. Um, how did you see electronics evolve over that period of time? Uh, It was quite an interesting career, actually. Um, I went from, I started my career in field services. So actually, I thought that was the most exciting thing was actually going on site, um, you know, working with customers, installing, commissioning, that kind of stuff, uh, including a four and a half year stint in the Middle East, which was quite interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, Very interesting, actually. Um, And then um, I ended up in R&D and uh, running eventually running um, one of the R&D departments, developing radios for um, warships. Uh, And we saw a lot of change there, although the radio communications itself, um, I mean, depends which frequency bands you're working in, you know, the basic principles don't change. Mm -hmm. But what does change is the technology that that gets you there. So um, we were, I mean, I remember we were dealing with things like, um, microprocessor controlled radios and software controlled radios um, that were doing digital signal processing, which was a a big thing then. It's now commonplace, but back then it was a big thing. Mm -hmm. And we were using, you know, all kinds of programmable logic and stuff like that, which is all kind of new at the time. So, um, you know, we had uh, like everything, people telling us, oh, you can't use these things. It's too expensive. It'll, It'll never make it for the price. And then, you know, by the time we actually got into production, of course, the prices have plummeted. So um, we, we had, you know, good technology moving forward. So it was an interesting uh, evolution. But, you know, radio comms are still radio comms at the end of the day. Um, I was primarily involved in the military side of it. So, mm-hmm. it was, yeah, it was a really interesting career. Very cool. So you mentioned kind of the technologies evolving, but the you know, basic principles of remaining the same. Do you have a favorite technology or electronic equipment? Wow, that's a really uh, good uh, curveball question there, Ashley. Um, <laughs> favorite technology? Um, yeah, I think actually going back to, you know, the radio comms thing, everything these days is so commonplace. We take everything for granted in terms of, computers and things and one of the things that was sort of grew up around the time that you know I was starting work um, in I started work in uh, in 1977 
so I'm really dating myself now. Um, but at that time, uh, Radio Shack, which you you know know of here, or Tandy as they were called, um, had just brought out their first personal computer. Mm. So uh, I went and bought one, and it was really simple um, things. And this was really right at the early days of home computing. And it was interesting to me to grow through that phase uh, of, you know, every couple of years a new computer would come out and, um, you know, there was a big push in the UK with the BBC for the BBC computer and all the kids had that, you know. So uh, it was kind of interesting. I think computers have always been at the back of um, everything I've done in in business. Um, so today I'm still doing a lot with computers and programming and, and, and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, that technology is, uh, is probably my favorite because as I've seen it from, you know, it's very early days to, to where we are now where we just take it all for granted. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I don't know what I would do without my laptop computer. Right. And, you know, you, you remember the days I'm sure before, you know, PCs were commonplace. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we didn't get, uh, at Marconi, I think in my office, we didn't get a computer, a PC, until I think it was like 1986 was the first computer we got. <laughs> and it was a knockoff uh, PC clone from a company called Opus, who probably had no, been dead for years, I'm sure. Um, but, you know, it had a very, very basic uh, processor. And I think we had a massive five megabyte hard disk, uh, which was... <laughs> considered to be big at the time but um yeah no it's it's gosh it's changed so much i mean there's more processing power now in your phone than we had anything like that back then i mean it's just ridiculous we just take it all for granted yeah it, it's amazing how far things have come Um, so I also understand that you've volunteered services with the Royal British Legion for over 10 years. Can you share some of that with us? Um, yeah. So one of the the things that I got into when I was at university, and I, I'm sure it's the same here in the States, but, you know, in the UK, you go to the sort of the Freshers' Day or Freshman's Day or whatever you want to call it. And, you know, you go and register for everything. And, um you know, all of the university societies and organizations are there trying to push themselves. So one of the things I got into, uh, which I thought was the most interesting, was the um, officers training corps. So the university officers training corps, which is the equivalent of ROTC here in the States. Mm. And, and so that was really good opportunity to do something extracurricular from university. But at the same time, with a bunch of other, you know, university students from other um educational disciplines so uh, that was great and i ended up uh getting a commission becoming a second lieutenant in the royal artillery and that was fun yeah. i would have had a military career but you know it didn't work out i went down a different path so years later um this was after i'd come back from the middle east um my uh wife's father that's my father-in-law at the time um was but had been he'd been one of those um you know, obviously much older than me he'd been one of those guys who'd been in the korean war and so korean war vet and um he asked me if i would you know join the royal british legion which is one of the um veterans associations in the in the uk it's the main one obviously mm -hmm. uh, equivalent to the american legion here in the states so I said, sure, I would, I would join. I was eligible. Uh, having had that, um, you know, uh, volunteer uh, sort of experience. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, and then, of course, things, you know, because he was on the uh, board of that particular uh, branch. Uh, so, you know, you get sucked into things. And the next thing, you know, I'm, you know, driving around the countryside because we lived out in a small village out in the countryside in the, in the UK and, you know, driving around to people's homes, you know, pick up their membership dues once a year. So it was kind of interesting to uh, reach out to the veterans and, um, you know, just just be something if they needed help or whatever like that. So, uh, yeah, it's my, my little bit of charitable work that I've, I've had some hand in. Oh, that's great. 
Um, so you've had a really interesting um, career star and very technical background. What got you into proposals? Well, yeah, that's always the question with proposals, isn't it? Because nobody goes to university to be a proposal manager. Um, how do you get into proposals? So I was working at Marconi. I've uh, been there, you know, a number of years. I've been running the um, R&D department for military radios. And um, I was thinking, well, what's my next step? You know, what do I do next after this? I've been doing it for a few years. And, you know, fate deals the hand. Uh, and we were doing a, uh, going to do a proposal um, with our Australian uh, equivalent, Marconi Australia. Um, and uh, they needed some subject matter expertise, and which I had. So it was, uh, you know, can you go and work on this proposal for a few months? And I said, sure, where is it? Well, it's in Melbourne, Australia. I went, oh, okay. Well, you yeah, twist my arm then. Um, so uh, I left my department in capable hands and, you know, went to Australia and ended up spending. So this was um, 94, 95, uh, sort of around that Christmas time there, which of course is summer in Australia. So it's lovely. Um, so, yeah, we did a proposal. I ended up sort of going there um, to be the subject matter expert on one of the technical volumes and ended up being the technical volume lead. So wow. that was kind of fun. And, and the problem with that is when you go back, people say, ah, you know how to do a proposal, don't you? Well, because mm -hmm. you don't really, but you've had some experience. So that's it. You've now been um, tarred with that brush and then you end up... Um, you know, well, we have another proposal for you. Okay. So this was communications for warship. Okay. I was in the UK. And then eventually uh, we were working with um, what was then Lytton Data Systems, now part of Northrop Grumman, on a proposal to the state of Kuwait for a, um, a big sort of early warning system. Uh, this was just after Call 41. I guess the Kuwaitis figured they ought to have some sort of early warning system in case it happened again. And so they had put out an RFP and Lytton was one of the bidders and we were supplying some of the equipment. So again, I went as a subject matter expert primarily, uh, but as a proposal writer, I, I knew how to write stuff. And then the people who were actually managing that proposal was, as we were called then, SM and A, uh, Stephen Myers and Associates, and this was in 1998. So uh, I, I was kind of fascinated by the fact that these were proposal consultants. Uh, well, what is it you do? Well, we, we go onto a client site and we help them win a proposal and do a, submit a really good proposal. And, and so what do you do afterwards? Well, we, we go and put our feet up until the next one. Oh, well, that sounds like a cool job. That's the job for me. Mm. So um, I liked the putting one's feet up after the job thing, which, of course, if you're working in a company and you do a proposal, you're just on to the next thing the next day. There's no rest, you know. So I kind of like that idea and becoming a consultant seemed attractive. I think I was at the right stage of my career for that. So I, um, I effectively jumped ship and left Marconi after 21 years, um, took a very big leap of faith and uh, joined SMA as a consultant. Mm, very exciting. Um, so uh, you started out born in the UK. What brought you to the States? So, yeah, so I, I, I did this, like I said, we were, we were doing this proposal with Lytton, which was in, um, in the San Fernando Valley, just north of Los Angeles. So I had been to the States before. I mean, I had worked um, in Maryland back in the 80s and actually worked in uh, the Gulf Coast of Mississippi back in the 80s as well. So, you know, US wasn't a stranger to me. Mm -hmm. And I came to California in 98 to work on that proposal with Lytton. And um, obviously, once that was done, I was then stuck back in the UK. So that's how I ended up doing a job in Germany. Uh, we had a client in Germany and um, I went went there for several months to work with them on, on actually more than one proposal. Um, but I had some ideas about how you could use Microsoft Word um, maybe write some plugins and things for Microsoft Word, which would uh, would help you with proposals. 
So the uh, SMA management at the time was kind of fascinated by this and said, well, you know, do you want to come over to um, California and sit in the office and kind of brainstorm that with some people and see what you can do? And I thought, well, that sounds pretty reasonable. Why not? So that's how I ended up uh, working in, in SMA headquarters in um, uh, what was Newport Beach at the time in California. And I thought, well, this is a pretty good life. And um, here I am, still here. <laughs> wow. Yeah, if you're going to pick a place in the U.S., Southern California is a, a great place to be. It is. It certainly is. Um, so you've talked a lot about Microsoft Word, and you know a lot of us know you as Word Man. What fascinated you with Word and got you so interested about it? I think the fact that you know I had started um, again. I'm going to show my age here. I'd started with a word processor called Word Star, uh, which was a very very simple DOS based you know word processor, and I'd done some pretty extensive. Um, not proposals, but technical reports for that. Did some big um, studies for the UK government and stuff like that. And we used um, WordStar to create that. And then eventually we all moved on to WordPerfect. Uh, and eventually we, you know, I was still working in DOS in those days. And, you know, you do some, there's a certain amount of customization you could do and configuration and create some custom toolbars and stuff like that, but not much. And then eventually when I went to Australia to work on that proposal there, um, the, the shocker was, here's your PC with Windows. Oh, okay. I hadn't really used Windows at that point. We were still working in DOS. Mm. And here's your copy of Microsoft Office with Word. Oh, I hadn't used Word before. So that was a big change. Um, and I kind of knew, I, I guess I used Word thereafter. Um, we all kind of moved, you know, from Word Star to Word Perfect to Word. It's just the evolution of things. Mm -hmm. um, but back in the, um, when I started working on proposals, I realized that I, I started getting into Word, creating, you know, how to create styles and stuff like that. Um, and I had been, back in the day, a quite avid Visual Basic programmer. So, sorry, a basic program, let's, let's say that. I'd studied it at a university. It was one of the courses. You know, we had a lot of um, tools at Marconi that we created using visual, using basic. So, you know, uh, the, the predecessor to Visual Basic. And then I learned that Word had this ability to do Visual Basic internally so that you could then automate it. You could create macros and do kinds of cool things. So that sort of... Um, influenced my my programming kind of need and i started learning visual basic and then visual basic replications as a side project uh, you know at the weekends and that kind of stuff uh, to see well what could i do with word and the nice thing about it is that yes actually a lot you can do with word uh, that it doesn't know how to do itself so once you get into the visual basic you can understand how word works from the inside and that gives you a lot of insights as to why things work the way they do from the user interface. So people are not, you know how you get those situations in Word where you go, well, why does it do this? Mm -hmm. Once you understand how it works under the hood, it kind of explains that. So now I'm, I'm in a position where, ah, oh, okay, I, I have some insight into how things work. And um, I, I guess that's how the Word Man thing started to a degree. Oh, that's that's very fascinating. Um, so it sounds like you've developed some very cool tools. Do you have a favorite or most memorable word tool that you've created? Um, I think it'd have to be the first one <laughs> that I created. Um, I do have, I, I don't want to plug them, but I do have, you know, several that I've created as commercial, commercially available. Um, um, but one of the things, they're all based on real world situations that proposal people have. And so, you know, one of those is I've got to create an acronym and abbreviation list. Okay. Um, I can go through it manually, uh, you know, go through the document and pull them out and make sure that, you know, the first time I use it, it's actually spelled out. And then after that, I don't, and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but I've still got to do it manually. So I thought, wouldn't it be nice if we could get word, a word add-in to do this? 
And so uh, that was really the first one that I wrote. Uh, and then the rest are all based on those real world scenarios. So I was, um, I spent a period of time from 2010 through 2013 as an independent proposal consultant. I actually went out and did proposals, you know, because I, I that's what I knew how to do. And I just fancied it as a, a um, sabbatical, if you like, from being a, a corporate guy. Mm-hmm. And one of the scenarios, for example, was, you know, I'm working with remote teams. Uh, well, okay, how do you do a, a review with a remote team? Um, and it was one of those situations where we couldn't really use, you know, we didn't have software available to do it. So we were emailing out, here's a document, please review it, add comments, get it back. But you've got six reviewers. So everybody, you now got six documents all with comments on them. And now you need to glue them all together into one document where all the comments are together. Mm. And, you know, that was an incredibly time-consuming, laborious job that was prone to error. Yes. So, again, I thought to myself, well, I can write an ad-in for that. So that's how I, I created Wordman's Review It, which was a little plugin that helps you set that up and then helps you combine the files afterwards. And it was one of those things that, you know, again, based on, real world problems that proposal people have. So there are a lot of tools out there now that do reviews um, and those kind of things. But, um, you know, they're they're corporate enterprise level tools that, you know, not everybody can afford. I've kind of gone the cheap and cheerful way. So if I can do it in Microsoft Word as a simple add-in and make it cost effective, then, you know, hopefully it'll, it'll, help somebody out and most of the um, feedback that I've gotten has been good so absolutely sound like really great and useful tools and solve some of the problems that many of us face on a daily basis so it's amazing um so last one tell us three things that not many people know about you well let's see um I think if you're a friend of mine on Facebook, you probably know this, but uh, I collect stamps. I've mm-hmm. collected stamps since I was probably 10 years old. Um, you know, uh, as one did back then, you'd get the stamps every week and, you know, do you want to keep them or send them back kind of thing. Uh, I now do it a lot more um, rigorously. I'm really into it. Um, you know, online, there's a lot more databases online available. And it's, it's, it's something that appeals to the sort of uh, detail-oriented, aspect that proposal people tend to have mm-hmm. uh, most of us i don't say we're ocd but we're very detail oriented so you know to have a, a hobby which is equally um appeals to that kind of uh, aspect of, of our personalities so that's one thing i do i enjoy doing that um at any one time i've got several things i'm trying to do in stamps so that's kind of cool uh i'm also very much into gin a uh, serious gin drinker <laughs> not as in i drink a lot of gin um, but I, I like trying new gins and, um, you know, things I haven't tried before and that kind of stuff. So that's that's kind of a cool thing. And the other thing I do is uh, I, I kind of started this a few years ago is I start doing uh, 5Ks and 10Ks um, just for fun. Uh, one day I might do a half marathon um, before I get too old to actually accomplish it. Um, <laughs> that, that's kind of where I'm working on. Obviously, right now, everything has been put on hold. So that's a shame. But um, uh, yeah, so that, that's something that I do. So those are three things that I do that I think if you're a friend of mine on Facebook, you'd kind of know that. But uh, other people may not. Yeah, th- those are very interesting. Sorry, I know I said that was the last one, but I have to know um, what your favorite gin is. Ooh, hard to pick one, isn't it? Um, my goodness me, hard to pick one gin. Uh, what would be my favorite gin? It's normally, it's the it's like the last one that I got, you know. Um, so uh, I've just run out of it, but it, it's something I've had several bottles of. And it's a gin that's made in Los Angeles. There's a lot of craft small gins, and this one's called Amas, A-M-A-S-S. Mm-hmm. And it has um, lemongrass and grapefruit and stuff like that in it. And it's oh. really awesome. Sounds delicious. 
a lot of the a lot of the distilleries now, of course, have uh, turned themselves over to making hand sanitizer. Yeah, it's it's very interesting and, and very nice that they have that capability. Yeah. With all these things that you have done, Dick, at what point did you, were you aware of APMP and when did you join APMP as a member, Dick? Um, so I joined APMP in 2001, um, so nearly 20 years ago now. I wasn't really aware of APMP until um, I joined SMA and uh, you know, Steve Myers, who founded SMA, it was originally Steve Myers and Associates, um steve was i think member number or is member number six of apmp so he was one of the original founding members and he's since retired from the proposal field and he does some more entrepreneurial stuff now but um at the time he was still the ceo of his company of course uh this is you know when i joined in 98 and i didn't really start working in the office until 2000 2001 so in in yeah i think it's 2000 so here I was doing my word stuff and um, word man wasn't really born at that point. I was just fiddling around with word to see what I could do with it. And uh, they wanted somebody to, they wanted people to do um, presentations for the APMP conference that was coming up. And this was in, uh, I guess it was May in 2001 in Albuquerque, New Mexico. So I really didn't know anything about APMP at the time. Um, and, you know, they said, well, can you do a presentation on words? I said, sure, okay, I'll put something together. Uh, looking back on it now, it was um, not my best presentation, but nobody else was doing it. So that was the important thing. Uh, so that's, I joined APMP at that time, I went to Albuquerque and that was my first presentation. Um, and word wasn't, again, Wordman wasn't really born at that point, but uh, so I did that presentation and then, um, the following year, uh, I tried to do a kind of a workshop. Uh, this was in 2002, so this was Salt Lake City. And uh, I tried to do a workshop, you know, where you have people bring their laptops and try and follow along. And I realized that this is not a good format. Um, you're always running at the speed of the slowest attendee. Uh, so it, it really doesn't work with a big group. And I vowed never ever to do that again. Uh, and I haven't to this day. Um, it's just too hard. So that being said, um, the editor of the APMP journal, Dennis Green, uh, took me to one side and said, well, could you write an article for um, the APMP journal? So I said, yeah, I'd love to. I'd never written anything like that before, so why not? Uh, and it was really based on what I'd done in, um, in Albuquerque, but, uh, you know, things, it was really sort of the things you could do with word that people may not appreciate. So, um, I wrote this article called word power. And at the time, one of my colleagues, who was one of our graphic artists, a guy called, uh, Sean Jones, who's a brilliant, um, cartoonist. I mean, he was really good at sketching and, and he loved doing superheroes. So we talked about it and that's how the superhero Wordman was born. And he drew, hand drew Wordman as this sort of, uh, you know, typical muscly superhero clad in um, blue spandex with a big white W on his chest for Word. And, and that's how Wordman was born. And, and since then, you know, I have, I have become Wordman. I'm certainly not muscly and clad in spandex, but uh, you know, the, the Wordman thing has stuck. And so, um, the journal article didn't really work out because, you know, it's such a professional journal. You're expecting um, citations and a big bibliography and all that kind of stuff. Well, you know, a lot of the stuff I was doing was was very um, unique. You couldn't go online and find other people that had done that or anything similar. So uh, it was very hard to do that. Um, in the end, uh, there was a companion uh, publication, the APMP Perspective, which is more of a newsletter. Uh, it, well, I stopped publishing it uh, several years ago, 2011 probably. Uh, and it was a newsletter that came out every quarter. Originally it was actually mailed to your house, which was kind of cool back in those days. And then it became electronic only. 
And so I was uh, offered a slot in that publication to do whatever I wanted, basically. So we created Wordman's Production Corner. And every quarter I would uh, create an article of several pages of stuff. And it was based on Word or something else that had intrigued me about Microsoft Office or something, whatever, something technical. And I, I kind of had a free reign. I think they were just grateful for the for the uh, page space, actually. So um, I could almost write my own thing, which I did. Uh, and, um, you know, as Ashley mentioned earlier, I'm quite proud of the fact that I had nearly 40 articles, over 40 articles published in the perspective. And they're still kind of available on, uh, on the APMP website. You just have to dig around for them. They're behind the firewall kind of thing. But... Um, a lot of them are still valid because they're how to do things in Word, like how to set up automatic heading numbering or how to use the style separator or, you know, what do all those strange little symbols mean when I turn on the paragraph markers? What are the shortcut keys? All those kind of useful things, useful stuff. Uh, like I said, it was anything that I found useful or interesting. You know, I'd write an article about it. Um, so, yeah, there's 40 of those sitting out there somewhere. Yes, so four articles a year, so that's like 10 years worth of articles, Dick. That's, that's about right, yeah. <laughs> that's classic, Dick. So you have been an avid contributor to the bid and proposal community, like, you know, writing 40 plus articles. And I also read somewhere you're presented in 16 plus bidcons. Uh, yeah, that's right. I mean, I've presented at every bidcon since 2001, with the exception of uh, Dallas and Atlanta because I was actually in Dallas, I was actually working on a proposal and uh, in Atlanta, I went to it, but I didn't present, but I presented at all the others. And uh, I recently presented at the, um, the inaugural bid and proposal con Europe in Amsterdam, uh, which it turns out will probably be our last face-to-face -face conference for a while. <laughs> so I was glad that I had the opportunity to, to present at that as, as it was the inaugural conference. So yeah, I, I enjoy, uh, doing those um most of my bid and proposal con um sessions have been more recently have been workshops mm -hmm. so uh it's not like a one-hour presentation uh it's actually a, a come along and bring your word questions and we'll see if we can answer them kind of thing and um you know we were all set to do that in nashville in may but of course obviously that's been postponed and you know hopefully we'll find out soon when that's going to be um, but I'll, I'll look forward to doing another workshop. So, um, yeah, I like, I like people to bring, uh, bring their questions because it, 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 it's easier for me in some respects because I don't have to think of an agenda and prepare a presentation, kind of lazy. Uh, but, you know, it's nice to be put on the spot sometimes and somebody says, well, how do you do this? Or why does it do that? Or do you know why this happens? And, you know, it's nice then to share that with other people in the room. And uh, in, in the last few bid and proposal cons these have been two and a half hour workshops so i expect that people may come in and leave and, and somebody else may come in later and whatever but um they've always been really good good sessions i do chapter webinars uh, and i've done some of the chapter conferences as well and those are more uh fixed presentations so um the ones i did in uh, amsterdam were fixed presentations but yeah i enjoy doing it it's, it's great fun no, 100%. Like, I mean, like, you know, you are a master word man, as we all know. So any memorable or interesting experience that you had in, in all these uh, contributions take that, that always you think about maybe some funny, interesting experiences? Well, so, yeah, yeah I guess I guess it's a little bit of a little bit of history. But so 2001, I give the presentation in Albuquerque. 2002, I try and give a, um, a workshop, a kind of a live you know, thing in tutorial, I guess you could call it, in Salt Lake City, doesn't work out too well, never do it again, bad experience. Uh, 2003 New Orleans, first time the APMP had been to New Orleans, which was a, a great conference at the, uh, at the time. And uh, I did give a presentation there trying to explain the difference between desktop publishers and word processors, because I think it was important people understood that. I had a lot of questions afterwards. Um, loads of people come up and ask questions. And of course, the problem is in, a, in that environment, you know, you've got one hour, in which case you've got to do the presentation and a certain number of questions. 
And then you've normally got 10 to 15 minutes, if you're lucky, to, to go to the next session. So, you know, um, you have to finish because the next presenter is coming in to boot you out uh, and set themselves up to do their presentation. Um, but I had a lot of questions. So uh, there were some people a bit frustrated there that they didn't get their questions answered. And then on the Friday of the conference, which was just the morning, uh, you know, it's the half day, and um, the then um, executive director of APMP, David Winton, um, said to me, look, somebody dropped out on the final day, so I have a, a room open, and it's kind of open all morning. You know, do you want me to tell people if they have questions that you, you could make yourself available? And I said, absolutely, I'd love to do that. So um, we started at whenever and what it was in, the, in that room with maybe a few people came along and asked some questions. And then like two hours later, I'm still there answering questions. Um, so this is a completely ad hoc thing. And people are coming in still with questions. And we probably had 100 people in the room at the end. So I thought, wow, this is a serious need that people have to talk to somebody who can help them through their word questions. So that was how it all started. And, and really from 2004 onwards, um, from uh, what was 2004, Hollywood, Florida, onwards, every time I did a bid and proposal con, um, or as it was then just called the annual conference, um, you know, it was a word workshop. And, and I would have a couple of hours uh, allocated for people just to come in and, and ask questions. And um, it was always, always very interesting. But in those days, I could pretty much guarantee what the first question was going to be. And it was, you know, how do I stop my, my text and graphics getting all messed up? Uh, people were having a lot of issues with uh, once you put in graphics and captions and had the text wrapping around it and things would move around and people didn't understand why. So that was nearly always the first question, except uh, at the uh, Savannah conference in 2007, which coincidentally I was the co-chair of. Um, <laughs> so I'm doing my workshop and uh, thinking, aha, I know what the first question is going to be. And uh, I said, OK, who's got the first question? Hand goes up. The guy says, so um, I'm having troubles working with SharePoint. And my heart sank at that point because obviously we didn't have SharePoint. Uh, it's very hard to have SharePoint on your own. And I knew at that point I could not help this guy at all. And I said, I'm sorry, I, I don't have any experience working with SharePoint. And and the guy got up and said, well, I, I, this is a waste of time coming here then, and walked out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so that put a bit of a downer on the room. Um, <laughs> but we, we carried on and moved on from there. And so, yeah, uh, don't always expect what the first question is going to be. Um, it was probably the second question at that particular time. But uh, but that was the only time I've really been caught out. Um, since then, I, I have used SharePoint, so I know what I'm doing now with SharePoint. Um, you have some interesting name for your Word tools. Can you share some of the tools and how you name them? Um, <laughs> Well, Acrogen is easy. It's Acrobat. That's, sorry, Acrobat. It's the acronym generator. Um, so yeah, the acronym generator is Acrogen. Um, there's another tool called Highlighter, which was something that actually one of my colleagues or ex-colleagues now had an idea for was, um, you know, if you're writing a proposal and there's words you shouldn't be using in the proposal, uh, you know, maybe you're reusing content and you want to make sure you haven't got previous um, client names in there or program names or maybe they're words that your legal department doesn't want you to use. Um, so, you know, could you have a tool that basically has a list, is able to access a list for that proposal, of here's things we shouldn't be using, and then can run through a document and highlight them and show you where that does. So that's highlighter, so that's kind of obvious, right? Uh, except that I spelt it H-I-L-I-T-E-R, highlighter. <laughs> okay, um, that's because it's shorter. Um, the requirements extractor became Rextractor, which is kind of funny. We kind of think of that as like the dinosaur of uh, of tools. Um, yeah, so that's that's really. I just try and come up with something kind of fun. 
uh, you know, that uh, I think it's part of the word man thing. There's a sort of a fun element to it. Um, you know, it's a little bit of marketing, I guess, as well. Yes, Dick. I think my favorite was the word man's Hitler tool for Microsoft Word. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's the highlighter tool. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of, yeah, I mean, it, it, it tells you exactly what it does, really. So, yeah. Perfect. I think, you know, going back to your APM pay, because you did took, uh, a, you know, a, a, like a different roles there, secretary, chief operating officer, CEO. Can you share some of your APMP board experiences and any kind of uh, memories or achievements, colleagues that you worked with, Dick? Yeah, so that was um, as a result of, you know, working with David Winton, who was the um, executive director at the time, although the role has changed now, it's um, chief executive officer as, as Rick Harris is, um, but it's the same role, just a different name. So David was great. He lived here in Southern California, so we were kind of close by, and he'd come and stop in our office occasionally. Um, and he sort of said to me, would you like to come on the board? And I said, well, I don't know, really. I've never done anything quite like that. No idea. No, he said, I think you'd be good on the board. I said, OK, fine. You know, what's coming up? Well, secretary position, which was a two-year position. So uh, after a little bit of arm twisting, I said, OK. And I went on the board as the secretary. And um, it was interesting because it's a good place to start on a board. And if anybody is thinking about, well, should I join my chapter's board of directors or even APMP International's board of directors, the secretary is actually a very good place to start because um, it's really record keeping. Um, so, you know, you're taking people's reports and compiling them and keeping meetings going and things like that. But you do learn an awful lot about the organization, whether it's at the international level or the chapter level. And, you know, the initiatives that are going on and who's doing what. And you learn some of the um, personalities that are involved and the history. And, um, you know, that's a good place to start. So having done two years as secretary, I kind of got a little hooked into being part of that organization. And um, back then, I'm not sure what it is now because I haven't, you know, I've done my time on the board. But uh, back then it was a three-year commitment to be the chief operating officer, which is a bit like a vice chair now, I think. And then the CEO, which is now the chairman, chairperson, and then the past CEO. So uh, that's, you know, one year of each. So I said, okay, I'll go for that. And and did my my three years on the boards, making a total of five years. And it was it was really interesting um, because I also got to be the conference co-chair along with David uh, for Savannah in 2007. So um, I think being involved in APMP International at that level, particularly back then, um, you know, this was like 2006, 7, 8 kind of period, uh, you know, there was a lot of uh, changes coming along. Certification had just started. Um, there were a lot of lot of initiatives being done. So, um, you know, I got heavily involved with uh, with the, working with the chapters. Um, one of the things I'm actually proud of is, um, as you as you probably aware, um, when you affiliate with a chapter, uh, every quarter the chapter gets a rebate of your, you know, a portion of your membership fee sent to the chapter. So, um, you know, if you're, uh, if you're not affiliated with your local chapter, you're, you're doing it wrong, as they say. But, um, yeah, so, you know, one of the things how the chapters make money is uh, to do events and things is they, they get that rebate. They get a 25% of your, um, of your uh, membership fee. So that was one of the things that I actually uh, increased at the time when I was CEO. And I was probably proud of that, you know, in terms of what did I accomplish? Um, there are a lot of things, that, a lot of initiatives that you try and do, but for one reason or another, don't actually happen. Mm -hmm. uh, but things like that, that was actually a very easy thing to get done because it was a simple decision. Board agreed it and we made it happen. Uh, that's, a, that's a lot of contribution that did. Thank you. So you mentioned that you were a co-chair for the 2007 Savannah Conference, uh, uh, Dick. What it takes to run a Bitcoin? Huh, gosh. Um, wow, yes. Uh, 
a lot of coordination behind the scenes. There is an awful lot of people. And back then, I think there's a lot more people involved now, and there should be because they're huge. Um, back then, for um, and I was kind of involved in the periphery of bid and proposal con, or just the annual conference, as it was called back then, uh, in terms of being on the committee that helped choose the presenters, in terms of, you know, looking at the... Um, the marketing side of it from the website perspective and doing some stuff on that. Um, but when I was asked if I would chair the Savannah conference, I thought, sure, why not? Right. And um, it's a hell of a lot of work as for one person. I mean, you're working with, I was working with David Winton. David is doing all of the kind of behind the scenes um, management stuff to making sure that the, uh, convention center was you know all the meals are going to be ready and all that, all that kind of behind the scenes infrastructure stuff and then but i'm running around making sure that presenters are ready and uh and all those little logistics things are being done and you've got to introduce people and uh, do all that kind of uh, be you know be the mc if you like uh to go up there and talk to people just as uh, we do today and so you split the responsibilities for that between the um you know the professional staff and the, and the volunteers um and i said after i'd done it uh as have a lot of people before me never again um <laughs> because it was just a lot of running around and and you don't really appreciate the conference because you're running around you certainly don't have the time to go and go into a session because you're doing something behind the scenes when the sessions are going on so it's it's like non-stop which is fine I mean, you know what you're getting in for. Um, and so I said never again. And then in 2011, I was asked to co-chair the conference in Denver. So <laughs> never again kind of went out the window. But the, the caveat there was that um, it would also be with two other people that had said never again, uh, yeah. which was uh, Eric Gregory and David Boll. And um, I, all good friends and we said, okay, but I think between three of us, we can manage this. Um, so we did, but we were all three of us running around uh, doing stuff. So, um, yeah, there's a lot to do. And, you know, fortunately now APMP has more professional staff, uh, you know, so um, you know, Rick Harris isn't running around like a somebody with a hair on fire. I mean, maybe he is behind the scenes, I don't know. But, um, you know, there's there's more professional staff, there's more help. Um, there's more people trying to run it. And if you're trying to run a conference of over a thousand people, as we had in Orlando, I mean, that's a lot of people. There is a lot of logistics behind that to be done. So uh, I hats off to, to Rick and his team because I know what they're going through um, and they do a great job. And as an attendee, it's all kind of seamless, right? You know, we just think, oh, this is pretty good. Uh, but trust me, there's a lot of stuff that goes on behind the scenes to make sure that it is seamless to the attendees. So, um, yeah, it's fun. Uh, would I ever do it again? Probably not. No, definitely not this time. Uh, having done it twice, no. But in the same period, Dick, you were also part of the California chapter. Right. Uh, the chair, you know, you were past chair, They're like seven, seven, eight years association. Would you like to share some of the experience from there? Well, so I guess it's sort of, um, it's just an extension, right? Once I came off the APMP International Board, uh, it seemed logical to, I mean, I was obviously affiliated with the um, California chapter, because that's my local chapter. Um, but it was you kind of then get involved, you're bringing that experience that you've learned at the international level and seeing how you can apply that at the chapter level and, and help at that level. So uh, I can't remember exactly when I came on the board. Um, I came on a kind of a strange role as a, a consultant representative, which was really um, a position that was, you know, representing the consultants, the proposal management consultants that were affiliated with the chapter. Um, but that got me involved with our annual, what we call it, training day. Every chapter has a different name for these things, but it's it's the California annual conference. We call it training day. And we hold it at Disneyland, so there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but uh, yeah, I just got involved with that. And it was really having been involved with the annual conferences then to apply that, that uh, lessons learned and that experience into the local chapter conference. 
and I'm still involved with that. And, um, you know, I took the opportunity to be chapter chair a few years ago. I've been the past chair now until the end of this year. I can, so I will certainly stay on the board as long as I can. Uh, I enjoy helping out with the chapter. I'm even if I wasn't on the board, I'd be involved with the training day. I'm sure. Um, and um, you know, recently, California, as have other chapters, introduced a mentor mentee program as part of professional development, and uh, that's a thing that a lot of people want. Um, I was asked if I'd be a mentor for a young professional. So I said, sure, why not? Uh, that seems the sort of uh, something you can do to give back, right? Yeah. Um, and now I actually have three mentees who are all awesome and I enjoy working with them immensely to help them with their careers as proposal professionals and help them with their work, you know, and the sort of problems that they have. Um with their companies um, and, and it's very rewarding it's one of those weird things that uh, you know i was uh, inducted as an apmp fellow which i'm very very proud of obviously and one of the things about being a fellow is that is what you've done for the association in terms of giving your time to the association or the members um, and so it's funny though that when you actually uh, become a fellow you know, one of the things is great. Well, now you're a fellow, you know, you have to constantly be giving back. And you go, well, that's how I got there. <laughs> this is rough. <laughs> um, but you do. I think the people who I know who are APMP fellows, um, many of whom I've known for a long time, um, are all givers. That's how we got that special honour. Um, but every single one of them is still doing that. So... Uh, you know, it's it is a great honour, um, but you know, I think it's the reason it's limited is it's given to to the people that um, have that mentality of sharing their experience with um, you know with with younger proposal professionals. Nick, uh, last question, Nick. So, why do you think uh, bid and proposal professionals? need to associate themselves with a local chapter? Why do you think they should do that? So that's a good question. Um, let's look at some numbers. I mean, California, right? What have we got? 13 million people, I think, in California, something like that. I don't know. So I think I saw that the other day when they were talking about the coronavirus, you know, um, of which a number of people are doing proposals how many people in California are actively working on proposals at all levels, not just in aerospace and defense companies or IT companies or medical companies or whatever, um, but all levels, right? There are a good number of people who actually end up having to write a proposal. Okay, how many members do we have affiliated with the California chapter? It's just over 300. Mm. That's pretty low, mm. right? So, you know, I always have this theory that, uh, you know, if you pick up a rock and throw it in any direction from uh, where I work in Irvine, um, I'm going to hit somebody who ends up working on a proposal at some point. Um, you know, they are blissfully unaware of APMP. Um, so, you know, the ones that have actually found APMP, why have they found APMP? How long have they been doing proposals? They're probably mostly newbies, people that have just got into doing proposals and somehow they Googled it or somebody talked to them about APMP and they became a member. And I remember our training day last year um, in uh, Disney, we had um, a good turnout, actually. We had a, one of our record turnouts. And when we said how many people are first-time attendees, it was half the audience. So that's trying to tell you there that here are people that have never been to a conference before and they're desperate to learn. They're desperate to pick up some tips and hints on not just how to do better proposals, um, but also how to do better as proposal professionals. And that's one of the things that the, the chapter will do for you. Not every company is going to pay that person to go to a bid and proposal con, wherever, unless it's next door, right? But I know people who lived in San Diego who weren't allowed to go to the San Diego conference by their companies. So go figure. 
um, a lot of it comes down to cost and not appreciating the learning that proposal professionals can get at a bit and proposal con, but that's beside the point. Um, so if you've got one chance to go to a conference, um, it's going to be your local chapter conference. And, um, you know, we've had increasing number of people uh, come to our training days. Um, so, you know, the chapter can offer that connection to uh, experience, not just from within the chapter, but from without um, at the training day, uh, the conference. But like our uh, professional development program now, you know, we're helping proposal professionals get through foundation level exam, get them going into that certification process. Because a lot of them can now go back to their companies and go, hey, look, I'm certified, you know, deal with it, <laughs> right? Go into their HR department with that piece of paper and say, you know, I now have a qualification as a proposal professional. So um, it, it increases their standing within their companies. Um, and the local chapter can help you get those connections, can help you go through that. A lot of local chapters, certainly in California, we do this. We actually sponsor people. Um, you know, you can apply for a um, sort of a, uh, you know, to have your foundation fee covered by the chapter uh, if your company won't pay for it. So uh, there's a lot of good reasons why you should be an APMP um, chapter affiliate and, and attend the webinars, go to the training days or the conferences, whatever they're called, you know, get involved, um, ask for help, ask for a mentor, um, you know, try and get through foundation if you haven't already and then move on to the, the next levels. Um, and I think there's a lot of benefit from that. Thank you, Dick. I think whoever listening to that, I'm sure now would love to join their uh, <laughs> local chapter or they might even create a local chapter. Well, well, absolutely, yeah. It's lovely to see, uh, you know, so many chapters now. I mean, my goodness, there's chapters everywhere, uh, all around the world, which is fantastic. Um, you know, the... Uh, Valley of the Sun chapter, which is based in um, Arizona, uh, mm. was the first APMP chapter, the first one to be chartered. And then for various reasons, it kind of fell a little dormant. Uh, but now it's being picked up again. And uh, I literally had an email this morning about could I do a you know, a webinar for the chapter. So, and I'm more than pleased to do that because uh, the people of uh, the proposal professionals in Arizona um, you know, they, they want to get their chapter up and running again and, and have a successful community. So, yeah, if you're in an area where there's no uh, APMP chapter and it's too far for the next one, then why not? Start your own. It's not that hard. All right, Dick, you have shared with us so many amazing contributions and um, provided some great inputs into you know, why it's so important to be involved with APMP and our local chapters and great advice and great points that you made there. We're going to lighten things up a little bit now. Mm -hmm. um, and we have our surprise rapid fire questions for you. <laughs> so the first one I have for you is using one word, how would you describe Microsoft Word? Complicated. <laughs> it's a good one for sure. <laughs> Okay, so we all know your uh, superhero persona of Word Man. What superhero is Word Man most similar to? Oh, that is a good one. Um, hmm, real, yeah, wow. Um, when we first started Word Man, it's not a, <laughs> I would say he's closest to like Thor. Because he he had uh, the original cartoon that we that, that my friend Sean drew was uh, the power of word and it was like Thor slamming his hammer down and, and there's a big crack of thunder and lightning and, mm -hmm. and that was Word Man would come out and say by the power of word and, and stuff would happen so yeah probably the closest but um, I guess Iron Man as well you know Iron Man's the, really the the technical geek the nerd right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. Love it. So um, you might sense a theme here. Um, what superhero is amazing in their book, show, or movie, but would be insufferable if you had to deal with them in everyday life? 
Uh, probably Iron Man. Because <laughs> 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 that guy really is quite the, um, yeah. <laughs> um, so what do you do in your free time? Um, so I have a day job. I'm a, I work at SMA. I I'm, I'm, have a nice headquarters job. I run the proposal development center, um, you know, do the proposals that go out of our company to our clients and a bunch of other things as well. Lots of other cool jobs that I get to do. But, um, yeah, so the moment that I put my feet up, um, you know, things everybody else does. I, you know, have a gin and tonic, watch some TV. Um, but then, as I mentioned earlier, my stamp collection is my enduring kind of hobby at the moment. And so I spend a lot of time with that, um, doing very nerdy, geeky kind of stamp collecting things. That's that's great. Do you have a favorite stamp? Oh, favorite stamp. That's a good question. Um, I guess the Penny Black, because it's the first stamp ever issued, uh, oh, but wow. I don't have one. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I did. Um, you know, they're, they're about, to get a decent one, you're probably going to spend 200 to $250 to get one. Um, but they are, they are very special because, you know, it was the very world's first postage stamp. So 1847, you know, um, it's one of those landmark kind of things. Uh, but I have thousands of stamps in my collection. So um, are there any just singular favorites? Not really. There's some nice sets, uh, which are nice. So um, I do like um, pre-World War II stamps. So stamps from the 1930s. Uh, they have a really nice, um, most of them are engraved on mm -hmm. plates. And so they have a really, from an artistic perspective, that there's something to behold, really. And you've got to remember, a stamp is, um, you know, we tend to be a very throwaway society, right? Um, most of the stamps that were ever issued have been thrown away. Right. And so I'm hopefully collecting some of the ones that are left. Um, and they're all little pieces of history. They're all telling you something about what was going on at the time. And so if you think of it from that perspective, you get a different view of, of those little pieces of paper. Yeah, it sounds very interesting. It's the same reason I like historical books and going back and reading things from the past because it's a, you know, a look into how things were at that time period. Absolutely. So if you woke up and had 2,000 unread emails and could only answer 300 of them, how would you choose which ones to answer? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I guess I would probably do the easy ones first. I mean, it's mm -hmm. what we do, right? It's, uh, right. you know, um, like when I did the uh, APMP Foundation, you know, you've got to answer so many questions in an hour, uh, 75 questions in an hour, right? You know, how many can you get right? So you go through the easy ones first, the ones that are obviously yes, no answers or simple. Um, could you cross out 300 out of 1,000? I don't know, 2,000, I don't know. But uh, yeah, I'd, you'd have to go through each one and just say, can I answer that right now or do I have to do some research? Um, so I think for expediency, I'd probably go through the, easy ones and then take another pass at the slightly harder ones um you know life's too short to get stuck on one so um you have to try and get through as many as you can if that's the if that's the criteria yeah very methodical what i would expect from you know a technical or engineering background yeah well it's better than um spin the wheel isn't it <laughs> absolutely <laughs> Lucky you, you get your email answered. <laughs> <laughs> mm, so how would you describe the proposal profession to a child? Oh, goodness, that's a really strange question. Well, normally it's like explaining it to somebody who's not in the proposal profession, right? You kind of say, so what do you do? Well, I help people win business. Mm -hmm. um, but to a child's not going to understand the concept of winning business. So, um, you know. I help people make cool things. 
Yeah, it's what we do, right? <laughs> That's what we do. Yeah, I mean, it, it really is what we do. It's uh, whether it's a, uh, you know, um, uh, everything from a IT system to an airplane to you know, a new drug or whatever. I mean, that's what we're doing. It's um, we are helping people make those things, helping people get paid for making those things, shall we say. Right. Yeah. That's a great way to describe it. All right. Last one. What's the most interesting thing you've read or seen this week? Wow, so much to read these days, isn't there, with the <laughs> coronavirus <laughs> stuff? Um, okay, I, I, I will. This week, I'm going to go back a little bit further than that um, because I just finished reading a book that, as you can imagine, would appeal to Word Man, appeals to my sense of um, stuff. And it's a book that my boss lent me. Uh, he picked it up in a bookstore in London and lent it to me, a real book, not a, you know, with paper, not an electronic book. And I took it on, uh, on a cruise um, recently, probably one of the last cruises I've done, be doing for a while. Um, but uh, it was called um, Not My Type. Yeah, it's called Just My Type. And the author is uh, Simon Garfield. And uh, it was published in 2011, and it's absolutely fascinating. It is the history of a lot of the fonts that we use today, like uh -huh. Arial, Times New Roman, all of those, Baskerville, um, all those kind of things. Um, it looks at all of the signage we see mm -hmm. and, you know, why those fonts are used and how did they come about and things like that. So, um, you know, if you are traveling on the London Underground and you see the fonts that are used for the signage, mm -hmm. you know, where did that come from? Who wrote that? Who created that? Why did he create it that way? Why did she create it that way? Whatever. Um, so yeah, fascinating book. So just my type, Simon Garfield. Dick, you have given so much to everybody around you, Dick, if you look back in your life and career, who are the people who have been most influential? That's a good question. Um, I think one of them, I would say it's a, um, a person, but an organization. I think when I, going back to, I mentioned earlier when I was at university, I joined the officers training corps. I think that was very influential. Um, in, you know, one of the things that the, the OTC does, that whole involvement of the military with the university is, whether it's in any country, frankly, here in the States as well, um, it's looking for leaders. And so if you have innate leadership abilities that perhaps you have not developed or have not been in a position to develop, or maybe not even know you have, it will help you expose that and then help you um, hone that leadership ability. So one of my great influences there was, was basically that OTC environment of being at university and being involved with something that was, you know, quite honourable. I mean, it's, you know, the military and, and you're learning a lot of military stuff and everything. But what you're really doing is learning how to use those innate leadership skills that you didn't necessarily know you had. Mm -hmm. And so that really, um, you know, helped me, as I mentioned, I'm not the world's best engineer, uh, it helped me move from engineering into management um, and then into proposal management. I think leadership is something that proposal managers have to have. You can't manage unless you've got some leadership skills. You can be the best proposal professional in the world uh, in terms of your ability to write a proposal or organize it or whatever. But if you can't lead the team, then you're not going to be very effective. So uh, I, I, I thank that organization for bringing that out in me. I think also um, I would have to uh, thank one of my colleagues who's now uh, semi-retired. Um, he's still doing classified proposals, um, but he's very uh, choosy on where he, what, he does, what he does these days. 
Um, but when I first came to California to work in the SMA headquarters, uh, he was very much a mentor for me uh, in terms of uh, proposal process. And, you know, one of the things that I talk about sometimes is people who follow a proposal process uh, as a process mechanic. So there's a number of steps in the process and you have to go through these steps. You know, I have to do the storyboard, I have to do the draft, I have to whatever. Um, the trick to it is not following the steps, but understanding why that step is there, what that step is there to achieve, what are the features and benefits of that particular step of the process and why you do it. Um, you know, with processes is all the processes are there for a reason, whether it's the SMA process or the Shipley process or the, you know, generic APMP process or whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, we don't just sort of say, hey, great, here's an RFP, start writing, right? Uh, you know, we, we do all that thing of breaking the proposal down and organizing it. And so this particular person who was my mentor, um, I'll mention his name, Bob Gurren. He's been around the proposal business forever. He was, uh, I think he's still the longest serving SMA employee. Um, he's had lots of different jobs at both SMA headquarters and out in the field worked on some really complicated proposals with our clients and uh, some really big ones and many of them, you know, classified. But he really exposed to me the, um, the reason why the process is the way it is and what it does and what it's trying to achieve. So when you understand why a proposal process is the way it is and what every step is trying to achieve, you're then in a much better position to, in a certain situation where you don't have the time or the resources to slavishly follow the process, because you now understand why the process is the way it is and what it's trying to achieve, you can actually then start tailoring it to suit that particular situation um, with a degree of understanding of, well, I can shorten this to this, or I can cut this piece out in this scenario, where I can merge these two steps and achieve, you know, a similar result. Um, so I think process tailoring is only available if you really understand the process and every aspect of it. And uh, and Bob certainly taught me that. And I um, I thoroughly enjoyed working with him um, and having a you know a social relationship with him. And um, I consider him to be a good friend. And he was a great mentor to me. Thanks, Dick. So if you look at your life. Dick, rather than career, do you are you grateful for someone personally in your life? Or um, well, I guess my parents, my late parents. You know, I wouldn't be here without them, right? Um, you know, they. Uh, you know, I came from a, um, a very much a working class background. They didn't go to university or anything like that, um, so they put me in a position to do that. I certainly wouldn't be where I am today without them. Thank you, Dick. One last question from me, Dick. And I did find a very uh, moving uh, testimonial that said, uh, Dick Eason, aka Wordman, is a real life superhero. What do you want to say about that? I think that's lovely. Um, I um, People, you know, say some very nice things about Wordman. Um, and um, I try and live up to that. So uh, if somebody emails me with a question, you know, I will take some time to try and answer it and solve their problem. Um, the superhero thing, I think, with that particular example was uh, that person had an immediate problem. And, you know, we're working on proposals. It's not something that you can put off for a rainy day. So, you know, there's a submission time and things go wrong. And sometimes people ask me for help and I understand the predicament they're in and try and help them. So, you know, if that makes me a superhero, then great. Um, but, uh, you know, it's um, it's really nice to get those kind of uh, uh, testimonials from people. I, I thoroughly appreciate them. So, Dick, we just have a few more questions for you. Um, what is one thing that you wish that you had known when you began your career? Um, <laughs> 
I wish I had probably been as um, passionate about things then as I am about them now. I think it took me a while to discover a passion. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, when I think everybody's the same, right? Um, well, not everybody, maybe, but when you start your professional career, you may not have a passion for doing something. You're, you're doing that career for all kinds of different reasons. Uh, it took me a while to find my passion. So, um, I, yeah, I think it would be um, don't worry, you will find your passion. Yeah, that's, that's great. And, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that can relate to that same feeling. Yeah, I mean, we're all kind of lost, aren't we, until we find it. We don't know what it is, and then we find it and go, oh, yeah, okay, this is what I really want to do, you know. Um, it's a question of how old are you when that happens, and can you actually take advantage of it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And hopefully it's never too late, right? But... Oh, gosh, no. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, you know, somebody said the other day, well, shouldn't you be retiring, or why? Yeah. <laughs> if you're still enjoying it, you know. Absolutely. What's the point? <laughs> when it's not fun anymore, then retire or do something else. Right, exactly. Um, so you mentioned you have a few mentees. What are some of the things that um, you're hoping to instill in those mentees um, so that they can continue on and be successful? Well, it's part of the professional development program. So we're trying to do two things. One is uh, I'm trying to help them with their own professional development. So in terms of actually um you know, with their careers in terms of like um, convincing them, it doesn't need a lot of convincing, but helping them get through, um, you know, certification and mm-hmm. and just trying to, you know, just gently twist their arm about certification. And, and so, um, you know, that's been good. Uh, and then helping them with one, I've been able to help with a career change, you know, so or, or a job change. So just being supportive. Mm-hmm. Uh, as a um you know um not as a uh, but both as a friend you end up with a friendship right but both as a friend and as a professional mm-hmm. so you know in terms of giving them advice on work related issues that are of a um management point of view kind of thing um you know dealing with other people that kind of stuff um but also uh in terms of using my experience and you know, expertise, I guess, in in helping them with their work process, you know, Mm -hmm. so maybe they've got a thing that they're trying to do. Oh, I wish we could improve that. Well, have you tried this, you know, so acting as a a kind of a cheap consultant, really. Um, But, you know, helping them personally, uh, which will end up helping their company, which of course helps them again, personally, right? So it's, so yeah, so there's two aspects I try and do there. One is yeah, helping them professionally as a as an individual and mm-hmm. then helping them you know improve their work processes and things like that without without being a you know giving away the store as a consultant obviously absolutely sounds sounds like they're very lucky to have you as a mentor it's uh it's it's actually very rewarding um from as a from a mentor's perspective yeah absolutely it's a great program um that you're a part of there Um, So over the years, um, you've told us a little bit about some of your many, many accomplishments. Um, Do you have a particular accomplishment that you're most proud of? Wow. Um, Hmm. Let's see. Um, I guess from an APMP perspective, obviously being uh, inducted as a fellow was a huge honor. I'm very Mm, proud of that. Uh, and then um, receiving the Founders Award, that was totally out of the blue. I had no, well, I didn't have any heads up when I was made a fellow. But I mean, you know, it was totally out of the blue. There are very, very few APMP members who've received that honour. Yeah. Um, literally, there's less than a dozen of us that have had that honour. So that was wow. huge from a professional point of view, I guess. Um you know, those those are recognition that you're doing something right. Um, you know, from a personal perspective, um, you know, I'm a father, which is always mm. a, a very uh, proud thing, right? Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, it's things to be proud of. Absolutely. Those are very great accomplishments. 
Um, so what's next for you? Um, well, let's see. Um, you know, it's funny because somebody actually uh, contacted me through LinkedIn the other day. It's a headhunter. And I actually thought, actually, no, I'm, I'm really quite happy where I am. I don't feel the need to go out and do that. I'm in a very good place where I'm, I have an excellent job. Uh, I work with some fantastic people that I've known for years and we have great um, professional and um, personal, you know, relationships, which are great. Um, I have word man. It's always, he's always there. So that's kind of a fun thing to do. Um, And that's like a little, what do they call it these days? A side hustle, you know, where I get to do some word man things occasionally. Um, And so, yeah, I mean, short of winning the lottery, which isn't going to happen. um, (laughs) I, uh, I'm actually in a very good place. So um, I, you know, can't see me retiring in, unless I become, you know, incapable. Um, but I enjoy it. I enjoy what I do. Uh, I enjoy my life. And um, yeah, totally happy. So what's next? More of the same. How about that? More of the same. <laughs> well, it sounds like you're on a great trajectory and doing lots of great things still. So So glad to hear that you're going to be doing that for a while. Thank you, Dick, uh, from both me and Ashley. Thank you for your time. It's been a real privilege to have you with us at Scribble Talk. Wish you all the good health and happiness. And please do continue to inspire, mentor, the building proposal, professionals, and everybody around you. Stay safe, stay strong, stay healthy. And thank you again, Dick. Well, thank you guys for having me on. I, I really appreciate it. It's, uh, it's an honor to be on your show. And um, I've enjoyed our conversation. And uh, yeah, say, stay safe, everyone. And we'll get through this. And, uh, you know, hopefully we'll meet at Bid and Proposal Con. To our listeners, thank you so much for tuning in. Please visit batchyscribble.com forward slash podcast to listen to this episode and check out any of our other previously recorded episodes. If you've enjoyed today's interview, don't forget to subscribe, review, and share the Scribble Talk podcast. We hope you'll check out our next episode where we interview another industry expert and special guest. Until then, it's Ashley Kays, Baska Sindrum, signing off.